have arrived at the halftime mark in the 2020 calendar. You are listening to the August episode of International Voices, and what a past half year this has been. I'm your host and moderator, Udo Fluck, and I have the honor to oversee the Office of Global and Cultural Affairs in Arts Missoula. Past five podcast episodes featured Arts Missoula Executive Director Tom Benson, Mayor John Engen, Dr. Sarge Patel, a British neuroscience researcher, educators from Missoula's elementary, middle, and high schools, and last month, Tony Grace, International Relations Manager in Missoula's sister city, Palmerston North, in New Zealand. International Voices with Udo Fluck is a monthly podcast brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and The Trail 1033. My current position in Arts Missoula provides a variety of services, all interconnected, ranging from managing Missoula's sister cities, creating global competence trainings for schools, city departments, and organizations, as well as developing community programming. But my formal education and 20 years of experience are as an intercultural researcher in the area of educational program development and teaching, infusing existing curricula with tailor-made modules that increase cultural awareness and global competence for both learners and teachers makes my heart beat just a little faster. When the pedagogical approach and content is of interest to educators outside of the primary U.S. market and can benefit students and teachers in another country, that's when my heart is actually racing and the blueprint is there for another International Voices episode. My guest today is from a country near and dear to my heart, Germany. It is an honor to welcome Daniel Bognar, former special education teacher, current policymaker, and head of the Division of Special Education in Germany's Ministry of Education in the state of Hesse. He also serves on the management board of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education to this podcast. While formality is valued much higher in Germany and many other European countries for that matter, American culture is more informal and in the interest of creating a relaxed conversation environment, we are even more informal on international voices. May I suggest we continue on a first name basis. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Udo, for having me on your podcast. I'm eager to learn more about your intercultural training and learning approach and content. Daniel, while you are 5,000 miles away from Missoula, you are no stranger to the United States and the Garden City. Yes, I have visited the U.S. several times because my aunt lives in San Francisco and I traveled with my family to cities and rural areas and took the opportunity to speak to experts in different places. For example, when visiting San Francisco, I spoke with a special needs professor and when I visited Missoula in 2015, I had the opportunity to visit with then a superintendent of Missoula schools, Mark Thane, and with uh, Frederica Hunter, who at the time served as a director of UM's American Indian Student Services. As I listened to your podcast, Udo, and uh, we had the opportunity to talk about our respective fields of work, we identified a lot of similarities unbeknownst to me, especially when it comes to the practical application and the real life examples and issues I see a great opportunity for teacher training and student participation in the German educational market. When did you start developing intercultural seminars for students and teachers? Well, I have taught semester-long courses and seminars for over 15 years at the University of Montana. And while many were offered in the College of Business, the College of Education, and the College of Humanities and Sciences. I also developed and taught cultural adaptation seminars for uh, the UM students that were preparing to study abroad, as well as those students that were incoming international students from other countries. 
Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And as a former international student myself, I can tell you that international students face special challenges as they adjust to uh, college life and uh, experts in the field have researched and published on this topic for decades. In, in 2015, for example, researchers uh, Hisio Ping Wu and Esther Garza and Norma Guzman published a research article titled International Students Challenge and Adjustment to College stating that international students deal with academic challenges, social isolation, and cultural adjustment. Specifically, academic challenges included communication with professors, classmates, and staff. Mm -hmm. In recognition of this fact, many institutions have developed uh, intercultural competence programs to aid foreign students with their cultural adaptation in hopes of increasing retention rates. Now, international students are not only the ones that struggle to adapt to college life, one could argue that many students who are coming from a unique cultural or ethnic background are going through a similar adjustment process with similar challenges. For example, Native American students leaving rural reservations to attend colleges and universities in cities. These challenges can be so intense that Native American students may have more in common with international students than with their in-state counterparts. Oh, really? Yeah. I would even go further and argue that any culturally different student and their respective group would likely face similar adjustment challenges trying to fit into the sort of established college culture or any traditional school setting. In, in Germany, we see similar patterns uh, regarding uh, stu studies uh, concerning students with special needs. Uh, for example, students with hearing impairments cannot share their experiences with students who have not experienced hearing loss. While inclusion in education uh, refers to a model wherein students with special needs spend most of or all of their time with non-special needs students, the situation of being together in a class um, is as itself not sufficient to be part of a social group, um, that is my experience, or even to be coming accepted as a, as a playmate. Um, this situation alone of a social uh, integration or social inclusion is not sufficient. Either classmates are not accustomed to how to communicate, or the student herself or himself is not proactive enough and needs facilitations. Hmm. The term uh, cultural differences um, you coined here uh, could be applied to the situation of students with special needs as well as I think. So how to cope with hearing difficulties, for example, that needs competences, knowledge and skills on both sides. However, how could they be acquired, Udo? Well, allow me to provide some background on intercultural communication and skill development here, Daniel. Um, anthropologist Edward T. Hall founded the scholarly field of intercultural communication while working at the Foreign Service Institute of the U.S. Department of States in the early 1950s. An intercultural competence really emerged out of research into the experiences of mostly Westerners working abroad, people that were Peace Corps volunteers, for example. And this early research was motivated by cross-cultural communication problems that hampered collaboration between individuals from differing backgrounds. I get your point, Udo. Uh, a prerequisite for a productive dialogue is a common language and the acknowledgement of common values. In, in a setting of cross-cultural acceptance communication, skills and cultural competencies can be acquired. As a matter of fact, according to Mitchell Hammer, who published an article in 2012 titled, Why is Intercultural Competence Important? In this article, 
he said intercultural competence has been identified as a critical capability in a number of studies, items such as job performance and inter-ethnic relations within nations were other topics of interest. In that same article, Hammer stated that intercultural competence is essential for transcending ethnocentrism and establishing effective positive relations across cultural boundaries, both internationally and domestically. And when I look at the most recent racial tensions in the United States and a similar awakening really worldwide, one might agree with Joseph Huber, who wrote in 2012 in his Intercultural Competence for All publication, which was, by the way, part of the Council of Europe Pestalozzi series, that there is a great real urgency in many aspects of our lives for education, which can help citizens live together in our diverse societies. Oh, this, this reminds me of a recommendation of the European Council from May 2018. Um, I had the chance to attend uh, a meeting there and um, it was introduced um, as a um, very important recommendation of the European Council because it expresses that we share common values and need to educate children accordingly. Um, intercultural learning provides a lot to society, it says. It makes a pedagogical contribution to countering populism, nationalism, discrimination and radicalization, and to be an understanding tolerant and attentive in a globalized world. That's why this um, paper from the European Council um, was published uh, to uh, create a European educational area. Wow, okay. And in, in Germany, according to a Minister of Education conference paper, the development of inclusive education in mainstream schools aims as well uh, to make every learner's education uh, success, as successful as possible and to promote social cohesion and social participation and of course to avoid discrimination. So a diversity is part of the real world and is the responsibility of all schools to embrace. And, um, what schools need to take um, is uh, the different aspects of diversity into account. Um, this includes, especially in my field, disabilities, and this taking into account is, has also a fundament uh, or a basis in the United Nations Convention of the rights, on the rights of persons with disabilities that uh, was ratified uh, in Germany in 2009. And uh, this includes also language, living situation, cultural, uh, religious orientation, gender, every aspect of life and living, and uh, of course, special gifts and talents. According to the education teachers to embrace diversity joint recommendations, it uh, says that teachers need professional competences to allow them to recognize pupils' special gifts and any disadvantages impediments or other obstacles that they might exhibit or experience and to put in place appropriate pedagogical measures for prevention that's the word i love the most uh, prevention or support cooperation and communication between teachers in different teaching functions and between the various professions are uh, thus gaining in importance and therefore Degree programs, the paper says, which lead to teaching positions in any type of school or at any level of schooling, should prepare prospective teachers cooperatively. That's a very important point here, cooperatively to take a constructive and professional approach to diversity. Huh, okay. Now, thank you for sharing that, Daniel. You, you had a, an interesting career with experiences in, in teaching and school administration yourself. You studied special education pedagogy at Frankfurt University in Germany. You taught at elementary and middle schools before becoming a principal and moving to Germany's Ministry of Education in the state of Hesse. You also currently 
serve on the management board of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. Now, the roles of teachers and principals are fairly clear and understood by most people, but what does one do at the management board of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education? Oh yeah, th thanks for that question that allows me to introduce myself a little more. Yeah, I have the honor to be part of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. The agency supports the ministries of education in over 30 member countries, so much more than the European Union consists of, as they improve their inclusive education policy and practice. And it also cooperates with transnational organizations, so it's not only a European-focused um, agency, right. and engages educators, experts, uh, learners, families uh, to ensure high-quality educational opportunities for all, as okay. especially for, for pupils and students. It is fostering inclusive education by performing projects, for example, concerning how special ed is provided, how funding is assigned, how jurisdiction could be changed, uh, especially by peer review. So to get a glimpse and in, into another country's policy makes yourself broaden your, your vision of how to deal with certain Right. aspects or certain solutions and we meet on a regular basis for that with all country representatives and well the, the main feeling is when you attend a biannual meeting is you feel as a european sharing common values such as free education free speech the right to verify government decisions um, and in, in that environment it feels good to talk to colleagues for our example from bulgaria from balta from Norway about their solutions and sure. ways to cope with, um, sure. for example, preventing a school failure or in, in general developing an inclusive education system where all learners, including those at risks of failure and most vulnerable to exclusion, receive a high quality education. There is a long way to go. The aim is not reached, maybe for generations, but to extend the European perspective uh, also is, is some issue of the European agency uh, to a worldwide view, and that should be interesting too. And our director, Cor Meyer, um, took further steps in that direction too. Oh, huh, okay. Now, I, I totally agree, Daniel. We share common values and, and those values connect us. And I think that's a, that's a worldwide phenomenon in a way that they make us more similar than different uh, many times. And while many people like to point out cultural differences, there is little value in, in this, I think, uh, if we think about embracing biculturalism and the work that lies ahead, the big challenges that we all face on a global scale will not be solved by dividing us by our differences, but by uniting us by our similarities. Yeah, and, and you're so right, yeah. I, I just, you know, I really truly feel that way. And while this sounds so easy, there are challenges. Uh, according to a joint article published in 2010 by researchers uh, Gudrun Myers and Viv Tom titled Intercultural Skills for Employability, a toolkit for students, academics, and work placement providers Students from different countries generally do not choose to interact with each other and establish genuine communication. After all, this intercultural skill set is not something that is typically offered in primary or in secondary education. And there is a tendency for students to avoid gaining these skills on their own. In fact, it appears somewhat unlikely for culturally diverse individuals to interact with each other, especially in rural areas, which gives the field of education the opportunity, I think, to, to provide a very enriching experience and for really to, to foster uh, an inclusive approach. However, it is commonly assumed that these programs will automatically improve participants' intercultural competence, which researchers Darla Deerdorf defined in her scholarly work back in 2008 
as uh, the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in intercultural situations based on one's intercultural knowledge, skills, and attitudes. However, the success of intercultural skill building programs is largely dependent on the level of meaningful engagement and interaction. Uh, yeah, uh, talking about uh, communication um, and communicating effectively and appropriate um, in, in these times, um, do you in incorporate any online learning technology to further facilitate your teaching because of the importance of creating a learning space that fosters meaningful engagement and interactions between students and teachers? And this is right now a difficult matter to, um, to, um, to, to, to put into reality. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, absolutely, Daniel. The, the availability and use of online technology and online supplements uh, really have the potential to enhance student learning and, and provide for a richer, more rewarding learner environment. Um, there is lots of research out there that supports that as the knowledge and understanding of online instructional design grows and has grown over the years. Uh, we really have the opportunity as educators, I believe, to empower students to become more educated and enlightened citizen with a, a greater intercultural and global savvy. And I do think specifically that technology can play uh, an important role in the student engagement and interaction piece uh, we touched on before. I would even go as far as saying that technology plays a critical role in successful intercultural teaching and learning. I also believe that technology is sort of the great equalizer, the, the integrator or uniter, fostering mm -hmm. inclusiveness in the classroom. One might have a different ethnic or cultural background, one might speak a different language or have a different skill set, different abilities, and whatever it may be, technology connects them all and levels the playing field. Yeah, the, the same applies uh, to the field of uh, special education. Um, it, it was and sometimes still is the expectation that mainstreaming will lead to a friendlier and understanding atmosphere in the classroom. Imagine then the disappointment when teachers had to deal with more conflicts, with even more conflicts. Um, so no understanding grows out of diversity alone. Participation is not a self-generating matter, of course. And However, and uh, while I do not want to be overly dramatic, uh, uh, a recent study conducted in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, found that 90% of all students in inclusive settings are feeling well there. Um, and um, the concept of well-being is, as we all know, the basis of learning. Um, have you uh, a hint for me? How can we reach further? Uh, what setting should be arranged that all students, even the 10% who do not feel well, so our aim is that every student feels well and um, can participate uh, with his or her classmates. Oh, this is so true, Daniel. There's, there's really a growing recognition that contact with other cultures in and of itself does not necessarily result in the kind of deep learning it was previously assumed to produce. For example, Gordon Alport stated in his contact hypothesis research uh, also known as intergroup contact theory, that under appropriate conditions, interpersonal contact is really one of the most effective ways to reduce prejudice between majority and minority group members. And while the research on this theory uh, has found that such contact can reduce intergroup prejudice, according to Thomas Pedigree uh, in his article in a journal of personality and social psychology, a number of important conditions must be present for that to happen, such as a safe and, uh, and equal sort of cross-cultural situation. Furthermore, as Milton Bennett explained in his publication, a short conceptual history of intercultural 
learning and study abroad, which, which he wrote in uh, 2010, reduced prejudice does not constitute intercultural learning. As he states, the goal of intercultural learning is empathy and not just tolerance. Not uh, empathy alone uh, and not tolerance alone. So how can teaching and, and learning go beyond tolerance and foster empathy more? Um, how uh, have you implemented pedagogically designed and facilitated cultural awareness programs? Um, can you share some examples? I'm very curious about that because experts increasingly recognize that students not only need to have authentic intercultural experiences in their educational career, um, but they also need help processing and making meaning of those experiences very if uh, they are to benefit fully from the learning opportunity. So very processing true. and making meaning of those experiences can be achieved by high quality intercultural training. That is what I know, but <laughs> what is your experience and what is the background of it? Well, since 2003, uh, I have been developing cultural awareness programs and uh, individual trainings and seminars. And while the target audience may change, from training to training, the approach uh, I apply pretty much follows a model I call the intercultural awareness model. And in the almost 20 years of application in the classroom, it has always worked, it never failed. Uh, very few things in life are like that, as we know, but I found a 100% success rate uh, when simply following this 10-step process. It is so simple, as a matter of fact, it's so effective that everybody can do it, regardless of age, gender, or uh, cultural affiliation. So I'm really interested uh, in, in uh, can you provide some detail about the individual 10 stages of uh, your intercultural awareness model? Of course, uh, as the assumption is that uh, we are centered on our, co our own culture, right? Growing up, Everybody yes. is centered on their own culture. Uh, families yeah. raise their offspring with pride in their own culture, uh, naturally. So if a person is never exposed to other cultures, he or she is never challenged uh, in his or her belief. This only causes a deeper centering on one's own culture. And people might even see their culture as being uh, a superior culture uh, when compared to others, as they have no other culture to compare themselves to. They believe that their culture is the, really the center of the universe in a way, and, and everything else revolves around their culture. Now, the only way to make a change to this is to this culture centeredness is to introduce another culture, to create awareness for another culture. And by the person becoming aware of the other, before one can understand, they need to become aware. But once that has happened, they understand the other. And this is followed by acceptance that leads to respect, which creates in turn appreciation and valuing for the other. So once a person has reached that stage, people often selectively adopt from the other culture, which helps them further adapt to the new culture. And once the adaptation has happened, the cultural competence is added to one's own culture. The knowledge, the awareness of the other culture is added to one's own culture, making the individual bicultural. And if you add one more culture to two cultures, then the competence would turn multicultural. So following the intercultural awareness model really sort of leads step by step to a bicultural or a multicultural view and awareness. Oh yeah, uh, the, the, the stages of uh, the international uh, intercultural awareness model uh, reminds me of the development of inclusive education in, in Germany. Uh, you said that uh, introducing a new culture this reminded me of um, the, the years following uh, 1960. Um, we needed workers for the reconstruction of Germany's economy then, 
and hired them mainly from Turkey and Italy. And it took years for them to become accepted, not to mention valued. Um, now most Germans appreciate this uh, introduction of a new culture, this um, diversity, especially when it comes to food. Uh, you might imagine Turkish food, Italian food. Um, and a similar development can be observed uh, with the refugees who fled from Syria and the Middle East um, in recent years. And parts of the society, of course, lack still lack uh, any acceptance. Um, but most of our society respect them. And a few value, um, to use your terms of, of um, cultural awareness uh, stages, um, a few value their contribution to our society. And this time again, starting with food. I, I start by myself to explain that because I went to a Syrian bakery in Berlin, where, which is very popular and they had wonderful sweet desserts. I never imagined to have the chance to, to eat those because they are very original and they enriched my experience of our capital city being really a melting pot of uh, cultures. But it seems a long way for one stage to evolve into the next one, and uh, certainly it's not something that comes automatically. So my question to you is, Sue, what, what needs to be done on an individual level, especially by, by teachers, to come from, let's say, stage four, which is acceptance, to stage six, appreciation? Well, I really think, Daniel, that by becoming aware of different cultural values, you gain a broader perspective and skills, uh, how to cope with uneasy circumstances. And this change of perspective is really important and is sort of the foundation of this, if you will. So in, in the field of special education, could one presume that developing awareness about what people with disabilities could contribute to the group uh, will lead to increased respect and appreciation? Uh, exactly, absolutely. Uh, to become aware of a person's ability instead of focusing on her or his disability by understanding how they could proactively be involved in the learning process of the class that leads to respect and appreciation for the productiveness and the contribution of people with disabilities. So the line of differences, which could mean a line of separation and causes of defensive moves, could be moved to a broader definition uh, of learning that includes cultural learning too. Could, could you apply the model of intercultural learning to the design of the curriculum and classroom when thinking of special needs population with disability? That is an excellent question, uh, Daniel. And I think creating this awareness that I mentioned before that fosters the understanding is the most essential element. And, and while I'm naturally coming from the perspective of developing intercultural awareness, I do think that the intercultural learning model can also be of benefit for special needs curricula and classroom design. Often people have a lack of yeah. awareness for the other. They assume that everybody is sort of like them, very self-centered in their cultural ways. And further, those who are not like them are automatically seen as peculiar or odd. So becoming aware of other cultures and other cultural groups is an important step in this developing of intercultural skills. It is also early enough in the process uh, to really positively influence the other steps along the way. So in mm -hmm. other words, if step one and two are successfully completed, then it's easier to follow through all the other steps. Sure, sure. Another important aspect is that awareness can be created through a variety of, uh, of different experiences or a, a variety of diverse media, if you will, in a, in a variety of different ways. Uh, a few examples may be ranging from reading a book or 
watching a documentary or listening to a musical piece of performance, culturally unique instruments, or singing in a different language, talking mm -hmm. to someone who is culturally different from one's own culture, trying food or beverages like your example with the Syrian bakery earlier. All of this can greatly contribute to creating awareness for the other that can then lead to this uh, to this needed appreciation for the other. And when one understands a different concept of a foreign procedure, that concept or procedure automatically becomes less strange and less exotic and even less scary. It allows us to see, again, the similarities that we all have uh, rather than the differences. Now, th this this sounds almost too easy, Udo. <laughs> Is it really that simple to develop intercultural competence? Uh, what are some challenges you needed to overcome in the process? Oh, yes, there are. First and foremost, uh, people might believe that they do not need any intercultural or global competence training as they feel oh, yeah. they are already culturally and globally savvy. And, and you mm. and I probably know people like that. They They often base this on the fact that they have traveled internationally, that they uh, like ethnic cuisine, or they have African American or Hispanic or Native American friends, or they know someone who is from a different country. The other aspect of this might be fear. Fear of the unknown uh, is certainly a challenge for people to overcome. They uh, might just want to avoid communicating or interacting with a culturally different individual as they realize that they are not like them and consider the option of just not interacting at all with them. It avoids the awkwardness uh, and, uh, after all, makes sense of the saying, ignorance is bliss. If, if you do not know about something, you do not need to worry about it. When it comes yeah. to choosing between awkwardness and ignorance, the latter should never win. Uh, what needs to be tackled and overcome is the awkwardness. Now, Daniel, maybe you have observed similar uneasiness or uh, discomfort when people with disabilities mm -hmm. interact with people yeah. who, who, have, uh, who have disabilities. Yeah, yeah. At, at first glance, people with disabilities uh, appear uh, to be different. Uh, feelings of awkwardness and, and even embarrassment come, come up with people with disabilities as well when, when one lacks skills, especially when one lacks skills of how to cope with a situation. We often have not enough encounters to be skillful. You have to get closer to each other, to get familiar to share thoughts and practices. And uh, you will see that the disability is only one, one characteristic on that person. And by, by approaching people with disabilities, by sharing time together, uh, one's behavior has an inclusive impact. Doing the opposite and avoiding them, of course, keeps one in the comfort zone. But people, without an obvious disability, they will lack then the opportunity to learn how to cope with a difficult feeling, for example, or a difficult situation, um, a new situation, uh, and, and thus not learn more about human interaction. Right. Um, and um, that, that's why the advocates put people first. They, they say it that way, put people first. People first means not the disability is uh, that what, what matters um, uh, the foremost. And by approaching someone openly, um, of course, you risk something, but you can gain an experience. And as it is with all experiences, um, some are good, some are disappointing. But, uh, well, you learn from them for the next time. Right. And um, my, my recommendation is when, when uh, you, you experience feelings of awkwardness, that you should avoid thinking, how should I, especially how should I deal with him or her? Uh, what's allowed? Instead, ask yourself a more constructive question, like how can I have a good time with her or him? 
Imagine, for example, someone in a wheelchair. Uh, don't ask yourself, is it allowed to ask him, how is it going? Uh, just approach him, ask her or him uh, if she or he is in a mood to talk. That's the first point I would recommend. Uh, then get yourself a chair, put yourself into a perspective that you can talk eye to eye and have a small talk about anything especially not about wheelchairs. <laughs> Maybe you, you try this too, but there are different <laughs> kinds of wheelchairs. <laughs> you can do that too. So, uh, but there are so many more interesting things to talk about than, than uh, technical appliances or uh, technical means to get yourself into, uh, in, sure. into motion. Yeah. When, when you do that, um, when you do small talk and approach someone openly, you can you can come in a way full circle. And I, I tell you, put yourself in an awkward situation. Just try that firsthand. Um, put yourself in a really awkward situation you never experienced and you're, you, you, you're feeling uncomfortable even thinking about it. But at the end, you will, uh, and that's especially for the students, um, something uh, very important, that at the end, they will gain, you will gain self-confidence and your self-confidence will improve if you if you can handle awkward situations because right. you will get skills you um, how to cope with uncertainties. I, I would agree, Daniel. Thank you for for this example and for sharing your experience with us. Yeah. Well, speaking of overcoming awkwardness, uh, how how do you recommend approaching those individuals that think that they are really are already culturally and globally skilled, but aren't and need it? Well, rather than arguing with people that they need it, which will matter very little uh, if they are convinced that they don't, I usually turn it over to the learner and let them discover what they don't know. I do a little pre-seminar test that basically demonstrates uh, their lack of awareness. Uh, yeah. This way, the listener realizes uh, they need to improve their knowledge base. They need to add a few tools to their intercultural and global toolbox. And uh, really, motivation makes all the difference. And it is so much easier if people are self-motivated to learn uh, than when you have to motivate them or to convince sure. them. Secondly, uh, the realization that audiences benefit from an individual pedagogical approach and customized learning content. That really requires a bit more preparation on the trainer side, but can lead to success no matter who the audience is. Uh, content should be customized for the individual audience and the specific needs that an audience has. Uh, this is especially true for the learner engagement piece. Customizing uh, content, um, do, do you have an example you can share, especially sure. an example concerning schools? Sure. In K through 12, I use hats from around the world and geography to connect the learner to the content. In middle and high school, that changes, obviously, because we're dealing with a different age and maturity level of the student. The goal, however, is the same for all groups, and that is to become more interculturally and globally competent. Being mindful of what is appropriate for what age level, uh, I incorporate and focus on the findings of Edward T. Hall. That works well for most age levels. He coined the terms proxemics and haptics, chronemics and high and low context in communication and how it changes from culture to culture. I apply Hall's findings to how people in different cultures prefer to communicate and collaborate. I also incorporate Gerd Hofstede's research and his findings of uh, the six cultural dimensions. This material in more business-focused trainings and seminars such as power distance or individualism versus collectivism or masculinity versus femininity, uncertainty avoidance, long versus short term, and indulgence versus self-restraint. I incorporate that in my intercultural and global competence seminars. 
I like to know more about that, Udo. I like to follow up on these terms you must, uh, you, you just mentioned, and I was hoping you could provide a bit more detail on the term proxemics, haptics, chronemics, um, very difficult to pronounce, and high and low content in a communication. Yes, absolutely. So Hall was an American anthropologist, a pioneer in his mm -hmm. field, really. As an intercultural researcher, he looked at structures that exist once one looks deeper into a culture, past uh, mm -hmm. the first layer, if you will. As a matter of fact, he wrote a book back in the 1970s titled Beyond Culture. And that okay. book was originally intended for the general public, but it sparked a lot of academic research in intercultural communication and nonverbal communication. And what he basically identified were these terms that I just mentioned, and probably I could provide uh, a little more uh, sort of a yes, definition please. for these. Yeah. Uh, so proxemics has to do with the study um, of the use of space and in, in uh, cultures, uh, how various differences uh, exist in cultures and um, how you know, people would feel uh, more relaxed or anxious about these distances. Now, haptics or kinesics are also a part of nonverbal communication, and they refer mm -hmm. to the ways in which people communicate and interact uh, via the sense of touch. That too varies from culture to culture. Then there's ocholesics, which is a subcategory of kinesics and the study of eye movement, eye behavior, gazing, and other eye-related nonverbal communication. And uh, chronemics uh, is the role of time in communication. So chronemics includes time orientation that people have, um, the understanding and organization of time. It includes also mm -hmm. the use of time, the reaction to time, uh, things like wearing or not wearing a watch, arriving or starting or ending late or on time are mm -hmm. all part of chronemics. And as you can imagine, Daniel, uh, mm. conflicting attitudes between perceptions of time can really interfere with uh, cross-cultural relations. Now, what yes, was the last yes. one? I forgot. Uh, high and uh, low context in communication. Oh, right. High and low context in communication. So high context and low context cultures place different value on indirect and direct communication. A high context culture relies on implicit communication mm -hmm. and lots of nonverbal cues. In high context communication, a message cannot be understood without a great deal of background information. In low context cultures, in comparison, uh, mm -hmm. it's a little different. Uh, more of the information in a message is spelled out and defined. Uh, cultures um, within Western Europe, uh, such as the United States and Australia, are generally considered to be low context cultures. Oh, very, very interesting. And because the, the concept of a differentiation of cultural practices, one can also work out terms of special education. Uh, proximity and distance are used concepts in dealing with challenging pupils. Uh, eye contact, as you, as you mentioned in, in the Oculasics, um, um, about um, communication uh, over the eyes is very important with pupils in the autism spectrum or in augmentative communication. Um, so it would be very enriching to go uh, deep here. Um, and thank you for the definitions of the terms Edward Hall coined and you explained uh, for us here. Um, could you please do uh, the same for Garrett Hofstadter's cultural dimensions? I'm also curious about that. Sure. Uh, in the early 1970s, Dutch anthropologist Gerd Hofstadter initially discovered uh, four cultural dimensions. Uh, power distance, which refers to the relationship between those in power and the subordinates in a society. This also includes how formal and informal mm -hmm. a society is. Uh, the next one, and there is no particular order to them as I'm doing them from my memory, and the next one I think is individualism versus collectivism, um, which basically individualism stresses 
individual goals and the rights of the individual person. Collectivism, on the other hand, focuses on group goals, which is best for the collective group. Then there is mm. masculinity versus femininity, um, distinct gender roles, assertiveness, material achievements, and wealth building are valued in masculine cultures, where um, fluid gender roles, modesty, nurturing, and a concern with the quality of life are values in feminine cultures. Mm. Then there is uncertainty avoidance, uh, which considers the extent to which uncertainty or uh, ambiguity are tolerated in a society. Mm. Uh, these dimensions uh, consider how unknown situations and expected events are dealt with in a culture. Mm. And then in 1991, Hofstede added a fifth dimension, and he referred to that as long versus short-term orientation. Um, and he added that to his earlier four dimensions of national cultures. Cultures are demonstrating a long-term orientation when they are uh, preparing for the future, when they are looking way ahead, while cultures demonstrating a short-term orientation are more concerned with short-term gratification. And then in 2010, so just 10 years ago, Hofstede mm. included a sixth dimension, and he called it indulgence versus self-restraint, which considers mm. the extent and tendency uh, of a society to fulfill its desires. So in other words, this dimension revolves around how societies can control their impulses and desires. Or, now, or, or people. Or Let's people, see. that's right. Now, let me just add one last note here on the content, if I may. Sure. While the initial research of both Hall and Hofstede are decades old, it has withstood the test of time. Modifications and updates have been made to the original work. And today, Hall and Hofstede are seen as two of the major contributors to the field of intercultural communication. Great. Th thank you for, for the definitions of the terms. Um, um, I really learned a lot from you, Udo. Um, just, just to pick one term like un uncertainty avoidance. I can imagine that it is a very important category in, in diagnostics of the ability to have relationships or um, to show tolerance when being frustrated. Uh, the terms uh, you explained seem to me universal for describing a culture as a whole, as sure. well as describing cultural practices in institutions uh, like schools, uh, as well as talking about um, interactions, about uh, relationships. Sure. Now, now, how is the knowledge only of interest to specific cultures? Does it only find application for a specific cultural group uh, like, like the Western culture uh, or Western learners? Um, yeah, it is uh, or, or should be relevant to all cultures and cultural uh, practices as it applies to every culture I have ever read about or encountered. And when taught, it might just explain to the members of a culture their unique behavior and more importantly, shed a light on other cultures and their members and how they're different. It does not answer the why question, but it does answer the how question. Uh, the why question is more complex and typically goes much more into the history or the unique traditions or customs and values mm. of a culture. The question mm. then becomes, how much time do you have? And the answer is often not a lot. So at least yeah. for the initial broader question of this person is different, I usually look at the how rather than the why. And yeah. when I teach much more focused graduate seminars, let's say, uh, there's usually a lot more time. The audience is, is, is highly motivated and interested to explore the deeper layers of culture. And, and when you think of culture, imagine the layers of an onion. In elementary mm -hmm. education, you stay pretty much on the outside layer. You might 
peel one layer away, but that's about as deep as it goes for elementary education. But it's a start, and, and that's important. As the mind of the student matures, you peel more layers of the onion away, and you go deeper into the material in middle and high school and at the undergraduate level in higher education, let's say. At mm -hmm. the graduate level, the whole topic goes in overdrive. The user group, the audience for which the training is developed, all of this keeps me interested and challenged and creative, yeah. even after yeah. 20 years of developing these intercultural and global trainings. I'm, I'm curious now, what audience uh, are you currently developing a training and curriculum for? Well, for the past 18 months, I, uh, I have been working on a project uh, developing curriculum for a program uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. So it's a collaboration between the University of Montana, the Salish Kootenai College campus on the Flathead Reservation here in Montana, and students in a geographically diverse alliance of over 30 tribal colleges and universities oh. in over 10 different states in this country, in the United States. The program will be launched this fall, so I really cannot say much more at this point, but I'm excited about developing content specifically relevant for Native students. Oh, me, me, me too. I'm very interested about that too. So your pedagogical approach is definitely student-centered. What about the teachers uh, that teach those students? You offer teacher training as well. Oh, absolutely. Teachers need to be included as well. And there is not just one reason. Uh, ideally, you want teachers to be interculturally sensitive and competent, just like their students. Uh, in the teacher trainings that I offer, I stress the fact that preparing teachers adequately is, is really important in creating uh, sensitivity and uh, empathy for the culturally different student and allow the teacher to really walk in their shoes, in the student's shoes, when it comes to uh, student diversity. The knowledge may also be helpful for teachers in improving communication and collaboration among other culturally diverse teachers. So not only thinking about this being applied in a traditional sort of uh, teacher-student relationship in the classroom, mm -hmm. but also to improve you know, teachers working with each other mm -hmm. in a professional setting, uh, in their team or in their school or in their school district. The idea here being for teachers, the more you are aware, mm -hmm. the better you can care. Yeah, I remember participating in one of the Global Competence uh, Summer Academies oh, that's for right. teachers you have offered in Missoula. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> I have fond memories of the training. Uh, even though it was uh, six years ago. Uh, in particular, one experience I recall vividly. Uh, you asked us to work in small groups, discussing with each other, with each other uh, how we were taught to peel a banana. Right, after about <laughs> After about 10 minutes of discussion and reflection in our group, we really discussed 10 minutes about that. Um, you asked us to share our ways of peeling a banana with the other groups in the seminar. And I was really surprised that there were at least, um, as I can recall, five different ways. And uh, groups had described how they could, um, or how they would peel the fruit, and actually they, they tried it. And I guess peeling a banana in that sense is like one's custom or, or a tradition. Um, they are a way uh, a part of one's uh, culture and um, you were taught something a certain way as a child and as you told um, you keep doing it until you are of old age and uh, never change that culture and ne never change that tradition or habit um, and you never question the way you peel a banana unless you become aware that there are really different uh, alternatives there. And at first it seems strange to compare a banana peeling ways, but uh, after I, came be, uh, I, I became aware of other ways of peeling the fruit, um, the whole idea of change of perspective, questioning one's view, realizing that there is no right or wrong 
way of doing it came to light. And I began to understand and accept that there are more ways than one, and I developed respect for the other, and perhaps even an appreciation that they had a different cultural way of doing it. And I remember it was like going through the stages of, of uh, the cultural awareness model you described earlier. Well, I have to say, Daniel, I'm impressed that, that you remember the Global Competence Summer Academy for Teachers several years ago. It was and, really a wonderful experience, Udo. Well, thank you. And, and it's good to, to get feedback from people that have participated. And it's uh, even more so uh, uh, when people remember um, what the discussions were and what the examples were that were used in a training. So um, I really appreciate that feedback. Now, having talked about um, the different application of this, and, and, and you were saying that you saw some connection to, to special needs education and that, uh, you know, the intercultural awareness model, while traditionally probably designed for a different audience, could actually be applied to other users and other user groups. Yeah. Do you think inclusive intercultural learning and teaching could be of benefit for the integration of refugee children uh, into the German education system as well? Yeah, right, right now we focus much on language learning in Germany. Migrants need to learn the German uh, language to become successful in school and at the workplace. And so we teach them language, we teach them democracy, the rule of law. They learn that uh, Germany is not a paradise as depicted in the media, meaning that people have to work hard and migrants most often need to work even harder to gain a standard of living. But to answer your question, we lack to see their contribution to our society, which leads, in my opinion, to an unindependence. Um, I know this word doesn't exist in, in English. In, in German, we, we call it uh, Unselbstständigkeit, which means uh, that a person um, is, is treated like being unindependent, uh, is not taken seriously for her or him, you do not expect any contribution. Can you provide a bit more uh, background on the current migration situation in Europe and perhaps specifically uh, in Germany, Daniel? Where do sure. most migrants that arrive in Germany originate from? Why do they select Germany as a destination? Yeah. In, in, in 2015, due to the war in Syria, more than 1.5 million people from the Middle East were seeking refuge in, in Germany. And uh, many more in, in other European countries as well um, that have less, ex in, in, that have, uh, less inhabitants uh, than the 90 million we, we have in Germany. They arrived mostly by foot, imagine that. Uh, and approached uh, the European Union's border over Turkey or by small boats over the Mediterranean Sea. So you can see how much motivation there is and how much drive it is. It was a great challenge and a risk for them. And uh, now it's for our society uh, a great challenge to integrate uh, all these people. And it is still uh, is... Uh, something we have to deal with. Um, well, um, after 2015, we made a deal with uh, Turkey to have uh, refugees located there uh, in Turkey, near Syria, in the expectation that the war would be over soon. But however, uh, the crisis continues there. As uh, the European Union is not only a union about trade, currency, and marketplaces, I told about uh, the European educational area, um, we also share uh, common democratic values, uh, and free residency is uh, one of them. And so many people choose Germany as their place to earn money and to live with their families. Um, because of high economic st standards, free education, free health care we share here and uh, we offer. Um, and moreover, as Great Britain exited the European Union in January, um, people from other European countries cannot just move to Britain and live there. 
So with one less country to settle, many people choose Germany or France or other countries as their final destination if they want to migrate to another country uh, to have a better living, uh, to be politically um, in, in a state where they can um, express themselves and sure. um, have more rights than in their own countries. Sure. Well, thank you, Daniel. This, this background is very helpful uh, in understanding the, the bigger picture of this. Now, how successful is their integration into German society, the refugee integration into German society? Well, that's a, that's a complex question. And it's especially um, when, when it comes to uh, your topic of, of culture, it's, uh, it depends on if, if uh, people come from Poland or from Syria. Um, some cultures are nearer to the German culture. Others um, seem to be more distant and uh, you have to learn more practices. But um, from from my professional uh, perspective as a teacher and policymaker, I can say um, that we are really very successful in providing education, especially language courses. Um, they are compulsory from kindergarten on and uh, even independent um, from where people come from. Even children uh, raised by German families who usually should know how to speak and how to teach German, right. uh, if, if their children lack the ability to understand the first lessons in grade one, uh, then they have to attend the language courses. Um, and then even for them, for the Germans, it's compulsory for their children if they are not um, capable enough to um, to follow the first uh, first lessons. Sure. And being competent in German means being able to become successful in school or at the workplace. That's the basis. Right. Um, and there are some programs um, when we come to cultural diversity and embracing uh, cultural influences that see migrants as a contribution to society. Um, but in my point of view, these should be um, extended um, and they are very important and it should be extended to have more, um, as you asked, uh, more success in into integration. It's not only language, it's there are other aspects. And um, what I think we still lack in our society is the attitude that people, um, for example, with disabilities, um, are and can be productive and can be proactive, can, can be a cultural contribution to the society, as well as refugees. And um, that is something I find uh, in every sense in, in your perspective. So um, what we lack in uh, when, when we talk in, in, into your, um, in, when we, we concern, uh, are concerned about your perspective, um, how to give children and adults with disabilities opportunities to productively contribute to the group or society as a whole. Um, certain steps are done, but, but the notion is not, not common that they are proactive and a cultural contribution. So maybe we can focus a little bit um, on, on that and it would be a great to enhance our collaboration and learning between intercultural studies and special needs education, especially in the field of uh, teacher training. I see a large contribution in your methods how to address the, the issue of participation in the classroom how to design a setting in which students express their needs um, experiences and share common values uh, with the aim of building a foundation of team learning and teamwork. Um, could we go into details here? I, I'm interested in how your program changes the attitude towards others. Uh, sure. Uh, the earlier explained intercultural awareness model is really the vehicle. Uh, yeah. What is the cargo to be transported uh, with that vehicle or pedagogically speaking, what is the educational content that needs to be conveyed uh, and what are the defined learning goals is, uh, is the question. I think instructional units benefit from a historical perspective. 
the mm -hmm. question, why is this relevant? How have we evolved? Uh, how did we get here? Uh, needs mm. to be answered first. Uh, how have communities, workplaces, and schools been impacted through diversity? Uh, this in turn creates ownership, a feeling of I can play an active part, I matter, uh, I can do something to change something. And I think that's really important for students and teachers. Um, mm. And uh, it may be slightly more critical for students with uh, disabilities, the more I think about it. Uh, the historical perspective will help participants understand the necessity of developing intercultural skills in order to function more effectively and efficiently in educational and professional settings. And this is usually mm -hmm. followed by a discussion of cultural terms and measures that are used mm -hmm. and that a learner needs to become aware of and understand before any acceptance and respect uh, can happen, which mm -hmm. then in turn creates appreciation and valuing of another culture as um, I explained earlier. And I usually provide learners with specific tools for their intercultural success and allow them to thrive in unfamiliar, culturally diverse environments. And mm -hmm. then the next step is really to build a solid intercultural foundation of understanding by having participants reflect on their own culture. And while mm -hmm. many people are familiar with the terms uh, that uh, you know range from uh, traditional culture or popular culture or folk culture or corporate culture, they are typically less able to answer the question, what is culture? So it's really essential to have an understanding of culture as a structure um, in order to develop intercultural awareness. And again, my example from earlier, visualizing culture as if it is an onion really helps in this quest. Uh, once participants understand the sort of multi-layered structural nature of culture, they will use the intercultural learning model as a template for moving mm -hmm. from a monocultural existence to a multicultural one. It, it has been interesting to learn uh, more about your intercultural approach and content, Udo. Um, I really appreciate that. It, it has become evident for me that there are indeed many shared interests and, and similar limitations. Shared sharing best practices can move us in the right direction, I think. Uh, we need to figure out, uh, in my point of view, a few things in order to move forward together. Avoiding leaving anybody behind um, and working towards true inclusivity in our society. Um, there is, as I said, much to do and much to learn. Um, and um, I think considering that uh, what was worked and uh, what has worked and uh, what not, um, uh, these experiences will help us trying to address the issues and challenges to improve, to get us to a successful, um, uh, to a successful um, society that, uh, um, that can build upon its inclusive efforts. Um, I use inclusion efforts in a broad way here, as there are um, two target groups we focused on today in our conversation, uh, where refugee students and students with disabilities were the main um, cultural groups, to, um, to use a um, a term that might come to my mind now as, as you introduced uh, cultural theories uh, into special education right now. Um, but there are, of course, other cultural groups uh, who would benefit as well. I could not agree more, uh, Daniel, with every culture and every cultural group uh, that is unique. And, and there are no two cultures that are uh, identical uh, I basically designed my pedagogical approach with a certain flexibility in, in mind. Uh, uh, it is that flexibility that allows for content to be adjusted to ideally fit uh, or appeal or relate to unique learners and teachers 
of distinctive cultural groups. So in other words, uh, what you plug in under awareness building uh, content and activity exercise wise is different for each cultural group and therefore needs to be customized. Uh, mm -hmm. But the learning goals remain the same. And, and that is uh, uh, that a student or teacher that has completed the training is more interculturally and globally competent and savvy than an individual who has not. I would be very interested in continuing our collaboration uh, and learning from intercultural studies and special needs education, especially in the field of uh, teacher training. I see a large contribution uh, through your methods and how to address the issue of participation in the classroom, how to design a setting in which students express their needs, experiences, and share common values with the aim of uh, building a foundation for team learning and teamwork that fosters a more effective and efficient intercultural communication collaboration. I'm very much interested in this collaboration to continue as well, Daniel. Uh, to share experiences and to help students and teachers, no matter where they are, learn and grow. Inclusion in education is not limited to a specific society or a country or a region. It is a concept that finds application worldwide. Thank you, Daniel, for being a guest on the program today and for sharing your experience and perspective with me and the listeners. Thanks uh, for listening. Um, I'm, I'm very, um, very honored and very pleased uh, to have this opportunity, Udo. Thank you. My international voice for this August podcast episode came from Germany. I have been talking to Daniel Bognar, former teacher, current policymaker, and head of the Division of Special Education in Germany's Ministry of Education in the state of Hesse. He also serves on the management board of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. Those of you who are a regular listener to International Voices know, being of German descent, I usually end with a German farewell. But today, I will have my esteemed German guest send us off. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, to the audience for listening from my uh, side to, or as we say in German, Dankeschön fürs Zuhören. International Voices is brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and the Trail 1033. This and previous International Voices podcasts can be found at artsmissoula.org and trail. 1033.com. If your interests are in global and intercultural education, programming, and international affairs, we hope you join us again next month for another episode of International Voices with a new special guest. Mm -hmm.